much for the introduction. Actually, I came to Munich already in 2006, uh, and uh, I also have a very tight uh, connection with Munich Aerospace. I have been uh, leading two research groups uh, with uh, Munich Aerospace. The first one is Spatio, and now is one that we try to fuse uh, satellite data with the social media data. And uh, today I will talk about AI, data science, and Earth observation. As uh, Mr. Klimke did, I also want to ask around. So who knows what is Earth observation? Okay, then for the 30% uh, who haven't heard about Earth observation, I would like to start with uh, this picture. Our mission is the Earth. And uh, why I use this one? Because this is sharing the same perspective as I, uh, we do Earth observation. And we are uh, using satellites, which is orbiting the Earth, to make the measurements of the Earth's surface. So why the uh, satellite is orbiting, the Earth is also rotating, actually, we could uh, get uh, measurements of the Earth's surface on a global scale. And if we would steer into any geolocation, we will also be able to get very high resolution data. And uh, our mission in Earth observation is that we want to uh, get geo valuable geo-information from satellite data to support different uh, uh, societal problems, like uh, better understand the Earth system, global change research, uh, meteorology is a typical field we are working on, and very importantly, the sustainable development goals of the UN. And we also serve very practical things like security, mobility, and city planning. And for all of this, data science is, of course, uh, very crucial because what the satellite measures is, of course, not directly different application would need to have as information. And uh, actually, the game changer of Earth observation uh, is the big data. So from about uh, 2014, you might have heard already about uh, the ESA's Companicus program. Uh, they offer this Sentinel satellite fleet, uh, which offers till now already 20 or more than 20 petabytes of data. And the real key is that all this data, they're free and open. So everybody, or also all of you in this room, you can get access to the Sentinel data. And if you look at the planning, we now have data access till 2030, and the ESA pro plans for 2040 is already discussed. Therefore, there is also a long-term perspective. And also, there are a lot of complementary new space company now comes to play. For instance, the Planet uh, Scope company, Planet Lab, they have uh, now probably 150 small satellites orbiting the Earth. Of course, you cannot compare the data quality with our very expensive space missions, but what they offer is they are mapping the whole Earth every day. So this is uh, uh, enormous opportunities. And because of this, we have now data, we have long-term perspective. A lot of uh, companies, internet giants, they are also entered EO. And all of this tells us, gives us a lot of opportunity, but in the meantime, it also shows us all the classic uh, Earth observation analytic methods would not anymore be sufficient. We need more AI for EO, artificial intelligence for Earth observation. And, uh, since we are having a lot of uh, applications, which is, uh, have a very high requirement on the uh, information quality, uh, it's actually not sufficient that we motivate some data scientists to do Earth observation. Instead, we really need uh, innovative AI for EO approach, tailored solutions for Earth observation. In order to um, um, promote uh, artificial intelligence in Earth observation, here is the uh, very important com component. So I start from the first one, the data fusion. So from the, for example, the Sentinel satellite fleets, we have optic sensors, we have radar sensors, we have uh, different uh, satellites orbiting the Earth providing complementary uh, information. So if you would work on any kind of application, you should think about the combination of different data sources you want to explore. The second point is data mining. So imagine we are confronted with 20 petabytes of data. 
alone to find the relevant information to explore is already an issue. Therefore, instead of sort the data according to the geolocation, we will need to really sort the data according to the semantics. So if you enter bridge of a certain area, then you get targeted uh, data. And also, since we have time series data, we should be able to detect changes and also alumni or novelty, which is the new things which is in the data in a semi-supervised or even unsupervised way. Machine learning and deep learning is also a very important uh, um, research direction. Since I will talk much more about this later, I jump to the next one, which is often still a bit ignored aspect, which is the big data management and high performance, com uh, performance computing. Here I'm very happy our new faculties now hire a new professor dealing with big geospatial data management. Uh, imagine we need to use petabytes of data, really do global processing. This is definitely very, very important. Okay. For the science part, I prepared two data science stories of our own research. The first one is uh, AI for you all. To be more specific, is deep learning in remote sensing. Um, for those of you who have been to field lab, probably you know the picture I have chosen. This is a Sentinel-1 satellite um, translated using deep learning to a Van Gogh style. So this is a symbol of deep learning and us persuasion. And the second uh, story is more about uh, so, so, so social relevant problems. So how we can monitoring the global urbanization from space. And here I choose a picture which is in Rio de Janeiro, where you see from the two sides of the street, you have the very rich area on the other side, then is the slums. So this is a very social relevant problem. Okay, so if we talk about deep learning, who of you have uh, heard about deep learning? Okay, more or less everybody. Then I think it's clear. Um, it's a special type of neural networks. About already 40 years ago, actually scientists already proved if you have a neural networks with two hidden layers, should, theoretically it should be possible to model any kind of nonlinear process. But then the winter came. What was the reason? Because lack of data, because lack of computing power, because lacking of uh, smart training algorithms. This was exactly the reason why now we have now the hype or the, the, the honeymoon with uh, deep neural networks. We have now all these three elements. Therefore, you see every day in the news, uh, AI-related news, probably behind that there is a deep learning algorithm. And uh, if we look at um, deep learning in remote sensing, uh, by occasion, when I was invited to write a, a review article, we did a literature survey. And what you see is this is uh, on the uh, upper right corner is uh, uh, literature which is related to deep learning and remote sensing. So I think this is uh, far more than linear increasement, right? <laughs> and if you, what I'm very proud here is um, if you look at uh, how these uh, different countries contribute to this uh, publication, you will see, of course, uh, China, US expected there on the top, also because of the funding and uh, many other reasons. But uh, Germany is not so bad. We're at the third place. And if you look at the institutional distribution, it's even more interesting. This is the top 15 uh, institutions which are publishing in the topic deep learning in remote sensing. More than 10 of them are from China. So it's a really very big uh, institutions. And if you check here, this is where the German Aerospace Center and the Technical University of Munich is. And if you check uh, the US organizations only on the button, there is the Mississippi State University. So I think um, we can be proud of this result. And uh, we have been from the beginning on um, uh, observing the whole community if we talk about deep learning in remote sensing, we, event, uh, we had three phases. So the phase one is quick wins and quick papers. This means what we can do yesterday with classic methods, we can now also do with deep learning, two or three percent better. At that time, it was already a very good paper. And um, from about 2016, uh, what we call the phase two, 
then people start to realize, okay, Earth observation data is different from internet images. We really need to uh, build tailored models and train the model from scratch. This is the phase two. And uh, now I think we're already in the phase three. So starting from about a year, this is, so uh, we start to remember, we need to actually Im integrate our domain expertise into the deep neural networks. A lot of things we learned already from the uh, past experience, we don't need to learn from scratch from the data. This is the phase three. And here is the example of our first one successful story. This was, uh, the work is done in 2015. We are participating in the IEEE GIS as a data fusion contest. And what we did there is that we used the deep neural networks fine-tuned with satellite data, and we use this for seeing uh, understanding to tell us where is urban, where is harbor, and so on. And then we use some computer vision techniques in the end, we are able to track very small vehicles, which is one to two pixels from the International Space Station, and also um, estimate the uh, traffic density. So I think it's a nice piece of work, but at that time we won the uh, first place among a lot of teams. Um, one of the main uh, component, I guess, is because we, used, uh, we are the first ones who use deep learning for this type of tasks, but of course, this is already the history. Nowadays, uh, such a success will not happen anymore. And uh, our strategy, um, of course, we want to uh, serve the wave of deep learning, but uh, more importantly, we need to understand actually what Earth persuasion makes deep learning special in, in, in designing the algorithms. So here I'm just listing a lot of special things of Earth observation. I don't want to go to the, all these details but the two points I want to mention. So what do we do with ImageNet, labeling of images or classification tasks? This is really a, just a very small fraction of the problems in Earth observation. Instead, we are rather more focusing on geoparameter retrieval. This is a more regression problem. And another thing is um, uh, different from the internet images where you take from the mobile phone, it's an RGB image. We have the five dimensional data. X, Y, Z is the location, T is the time component, lambda stands for wavelength, this is a different sensoric we have. So these two points I want to mention, but what we, our strategy is to take care of all of this. And actually in the group of uh, uh, TUM and the DRR, we now have about 50 scientists working on deep learning and remote sensing, and we are using deep uh, models for different types of problem. For instance, detection and the tracking of ships and the vehicles. On, only on this bully point, I'm talking about four different research topics, and the list goes on and on. And what I want to highlight is what you see here, probably some of you are working with atmospheric uh, uh, products uh, provided by the Sentinel 5P, where the air is uh, actually responsible for uh, half of the gas concentration deliverable. And actually behind the product you're using, we are already using machine learning deep learning algorithms to speed up the uh, radiative transfer for 300 times, such that we are able to offer actually this type of uh, product to all the scientists. Okay, I now want to uh, show you a quick uh, picture show of a small selection of deep neural networks uh, tailored for EO problem that has been developed by our scientists. This is what I usually call our deep net zoom. And believe me, this is probably 10% of the things we do. And I now directly go to some uh, interesting examples. The first one is global applications with Sentinels. So, um, for instance, Sentinel-2 is a super spectral satellite. If you want to use Sentinel-2 for uh, applications, what would be the first problem you would encounter? It's the cloud. Because uh, you, eventually 67% of the uh, Earth coverage, you have the clouds, and uh, you need to first deal with the clouds. Therefore, one of the ideas what we are doing is we are uh, using the uh, geometric information of uh, radar, which is Sentinel-1, uh, combined with the cloudy Sentinel-2 image, 
And then we're using this kind of generative models to generate cloud-free uh, images. And this is some preliminary results. Well, here is the geometric information from radar. Here is the cloudy Sentinel-2. Here is our target image. On the right, you can see the outputs from the deep learning model. So you can see it already gives uh, us quite promising results. And uh, one of the scientists who is working on that, Lisa Schmidt, is also in the audience. And the second uh, example I show is time um, um, series data analysis. Because with uh, uh, Sentinels, we have every week a coverage of a certain geolocation. And uh, uh, currently, the state of the art uh, methods for time series uh, data analysis is a stack of uh, convolutional neural networks with uh, recurrent neural networks. For those who are not familiar with these terms, Convolutional neural uh, networks can help us to extract uh, high-level features, like uh, not only the edges uh, and so on, rather the shape of a certain object. This is called high-level features. And then we stack with recurrent one, which is uh, very good at uh, uh, modeling the sequential behavior of the data. In the end, then we are able to output uh, the binary change detection. Red means change, uh, no color means no change. And the bottom is multi-class change, what has been changed to what. And here is an example. So this is a, a satellite image with a three-year difference. In the middle, you see where change has happened. And on the right, you will see where you see the city expansion, where you have soil change and the water change. And of course, this is a gener generic framework. You can also insert a huge time stacks and you will be able to see, for instance, a dynamic city like Beijing, how it has been grown in the past 30 years. And uh, the, this goes on till 2016. And the light, the color, then this is more uh, new urban areas. And this is an example I usually use to make fun about Germany. <laughs> what do you see? This is the Munich airport. It takes really a long, long time till we finish the construction. And uh, you know, but we are a German engineering standard. I think uh, with a very expensive satellite, time series data we will prove uh, the quality is really good. OK, so this is with the Sentinels. Now, if we have very high resolution, uh, for instance, uh, if we have the planet data, as I mentioned before, every day we have a global coverage. Um, we can use uh, um, deep neural networks, for instance, to extract all the buildings from these kind of images. And if we're using more fancy networks like uh, multitasking ones, we can even get instance, which means which pixels belongs to which building, such that you get all the pixels belongs to individual buildings like this. And if we would have a video, then you can even do much more fun things. Uh, so you can do the detection and the tracking of the cars. And here, for those who is deep learning experts, we use the rotatable uh, ankles such that we were not losing the object when it's turning. OK, this is a few examples I brought today. And here is our current research agenda for AI for EO. Um, we really focus at uh, grand uh, challenges like uh, urbanization, like contributing to the indices of the uh, UN's SDGs, or uh, let's uh, support uh, information for climate change research. And if we talk about the methodologic uh, focus, uh, then it's more how could we, for instance, uh, re-implant uh, implant physics, space, and the domain expertise into this black box type of uh, deep learning solution. And the reasoning, I will mention this later, uh, transferability of deepness, because if you are working on global research, can you use a model trend in Europe and apply it to Africa? This type of question, we need answers. And uh, uh, in remote sensing, we will have very uh, limited number of annotated data. They are full with noise. How could we handle with these cases? And of course, uh, if we are talking about Earth observation, then we are not talking about fancy pictures. Every result is a geodetic measurement. How to quantify the uncertainty is, of course, uh, very important. And ethics, and etc. So this is our current focus. And this brings to the end of my first story. And now I will start with the second story. 
it's about global urban mapping. So, um, of course, uh, I said we are contributing to the SDGs. And for this work, then we are mostly contributing to uh, SDG 1, which is no poverty, and the 11th, which is the sustainable cities and the community. And I'm sure all of you know is that urbanization is a mega trend. So here it basically shows uh, evolving with the time, the population of rural and urban area, how it's uh, changing. Basically, starting from 2008, we have more people living in cities than in rural areas. And the tier 2050, we're expecting about uh, 2.7 billion people more that eventually all live in cities. And what you, however, probably not know is that actually from about 2014, uh, in the IPCC report, there is a new ch chapter, which is about urban areas. So this means human activities really have a huge impact already on our climate. And what you probably also not know is where urbanization is actually happening. If you look at this picture, this is urbanization through geo, uh, spatial distribution. So dark moments establish urbanization. If the color is bright, then it's where urbanization is happening. It's very easy to see urbanization is mostly happening in developing areas, in um, Africa, in South America, in Asia. And here, urbanization, if it's not very well controlled, this can lead to very severe social problems. I would like to highlight one example, which is in Mumbai. Recent news tells actually in the past decades, there are about 50,000 fires happening in Mumbai city. And about 70% is actually simply caused by faulty wiring, so how you place the wires and so on. And in order to somehow uh, help uh, uncontrolled urbanization to help the slum areas, the first thing we need is geoinformation. But there is a huge ga gap between what is needed and what is there. So I give another example. This is a Lagos city uh, in Africa. It's a city with uh, more than 20 million uh, population. For such a city, we even don't have a 3D model of the city, of the buildings. So this is the information uh, we actually have. So guess if we talk about global urban mapping, which level of information we could expect? Existing ones. Existing ones, yes. Picture. Picture. Any other ideas? So something like this. This is uh, actually a very nice product from uh, German Aerospace Center. It's called, uh, uh, German, uh, um, uh, this is called uh, Global Urban Footprint. What it is, it's actually a binary mask of urban and non-urban derived from our Tandem X data in 2012 with a space distance of 12 meter. This was uh, the state of the art. Nowadays, there are more layers coming out, but the information uh, uh, level of detail remains uh, at this level. So this is the kind of information we can expect if we would want to improve a city in Africa. So this is, of course, not sufficient. Therefore, in the framework of an ERC grant, uh, my group, what we are trying to do, we try to fuse uh, data from the uh, satellite and the social media. And what we are aiming at is to deliver the first 3D and the 4D global urban models really on individual building level. So we want to have the building shapes plus the height and also how it evolves over time. We look at the building types. Is this residential, commercial, mixed use, and et cetera? And also we want to get a transparent way to measure the population density. The fact is in some areas, the population density is extremely underestimated. This is what we want to do. And how do we do that? We are using um, um, multi hyperspectral satellites from the top to get the building roof materials. We are using radar sensors to get the building shapes. And what is uh, very interesting is that we can combine with the social media images, which is taken from the ground level. And also, we can analyze the anomalous uh, streamed uh, tweets and with this information, which can help us a lot to get the functions of the buildings. 
uh, let's take tweets as an example. So um, if uh, people would tweet different contents when they are at a working place or they are at home uh, after some topic modeling, and uh, this is basically the idea, how we want to do. And this is actually much more ambitious than this view graph show because we have to deal in about 10 petabytes of data. So if you don't have an idea how much is 10 petabytes of data, one of our PC maximum probably will have one terabyte. One petabyte is already 1,000 times. Basically, then 10 times, this is the amount of data we're dealing with. And this is already, I checked the statistic of today, one third of the remote sensing data archive of Germany. So this is a, a huge project uh, in front of us. And uh, today, I will be able to show you some of the progress we already made. So how do we use radar satellite to get the 3D uh, information of the buildings? So basically, this is the radar image looks like. So you know, radar is active sensor, send wave or uh, a package of waves, and then um, receives echo. Here is the intensity map, which shows how strong is the returned echo. And of course, if you look at the images, you can. This is Berlin, by the way. You will see a lot of detail of the urban area. But still, you see all the buildings collapse down to the ground because of the special geometry we have. This is because you have radar looking from the side. Basically, all the points will have the same distance to the radar. They will be in one pixel. And what do we do to overcome this problem? It's the so-called X-ray of the Earth. Every 11 days, uh, the satellite will uh, pass through the same spot. Uh, we take a picture from a slightly different position. Uh, this uh, process repeat again and again, and after we connected enough number of images, we will be able to do a full 3D reconstruction of the Earth's surface. And for those who does not know um, um, uh, tomography, you can compare to the CT. So, but this is the CT of the Earth. We don't do a 360 degree scan. It's a small angle diversity, and we don't recording the transparencies rather the reflectance. And if we have, uh, um, let's say, enough, e enough number of images, smart algorithms, we have a supercomputing behind us, then we are able to get this very nice reconstruction of uh, Berlin. And this is, uh, um, let's say, the color stands for the height. Here is the post time plot, uh, Rex attack. And we are getting points with one million point per kilometer square. And what is, uh, yeah. I thought I don't show, but I'm so proud about this. So if you see this kind of regular rasters along the roads, these are the lamp posts along the roads. So it's very detailed information. And what's more important, the things we are uh, actually ta taking the images from different times, we can also see the tiny changes, which is in the fraction of the wavelengths, which is actually a millimeter and a centimeter. And here I show you an example. So this is the convention center of Las Vegas we will be able to get uh, this kind of uh, long-term subsidence of the Earth's surface up to centimeter per year. And behind each of these points, we will get a very nice deformation history. So starting from some kind of uh, temperature change induced summer donation, and then the underwater extraction due to a gulf place, then it goes down like this. So you can imagine this kind of information is very important for the health of the building. But still, this today has nothing to do with global urban mapping because we cannot expect such quality of data, so many on a global scale. So what we actually have on a global scale is uh, Tunnel X. So this shows you basically how Tunnel X can map the Earth in a year. And if we switch now from Terrace X data to Tunnel X, this means two numbers. We don't have a half meter resolution data, we have three to four meter resolution. We don't have 20 images, we have to up, up to five uh, images. So the problem becomes much, much more harder. And therefore we are using a data science approach to cope with this problem. And using the same technique, X-ray of the Earth, where we can get the building height. And I showed you already how could we use planet data and the deep new networks to get the building shapes. And if we combine these two information together, this here, what you see, is the first impression of the global 3D urban models. And this is what you can also expect in two years in Africa. 
So we will go global um, um, in 2021, and uh, we have done a comparison with about uh, 30,000 buildings uh, compared to LiDAR data, and we get a building height accuracy which is better than two meter. I think it's far more better than what we have today. Okay, so this was about 3D. How about settlement types? How can I tell where is commercial, where is residential, where are the slums? In the beginning, I saw this problem is quite straightforward. We connect a lot of samples from everywhere, and then we throw it into a, a huge deep learning model, and then we train the master, it will do the work. And the, uh, the crucial re reality um, is uh, the following. Um, actually, different cultural uh, areas, there's a totally different morphology of uh, different things. Let's take some as example. If it's in Rio de Janeiro, it's really this kind of uh, uh, low and uh, lightweight uh, uh, buildings like what we imagine as slums. But if you go to Paris, this is actually high-rise buildings. So this means actually one step uh, to Rome is not possible. Therefore, we have chosen a compromise. What we did is to first uh, to uh, classify the morphology. So how compact how high and how much green is in the urban areas. And what we're using is the climate uh, zones uh, classification schema. This is shown here. Basically, you see it's, uh, the first one is the high-rise compact. The second one is uh, middle-rise compact. So it's describing the compactness, height, and the percentage of green of the urban area, exactly what we want. And on the right is the um, LCZ map of Vancouver. This can be the first step, and it helps also for us to go to the next step, uh, the type of settlements. For instance, if you look at the high-rise compact area of uh, Vancouver, this is actually exactly the city center areas. If you look at the seventh class, which is uh, lightweight, no rise, then probably you can immediately reflect, this is how it should look like. So it's very closely related to slums. So this is the plan. And the first difficulty we had is we, are, we don't have the labeled data. So uh, we need really hand label uh, 42 cities because this is a universal answer to everything. We need something to start with. And we need to manually figure out where are the high-rise compact and middle-rise compact sparsely built uh, areas. And this labeling effort alone is already 15 people for one month. And uh, after a while, when the flight gets landing, you start to count, okay, this is the high-rise compact, this is the bus build. This is the effect of the labeling process. And uh, I think what we did really good here is that uh, we don't only do a labeling, we also provide a confidence score about our labeling. So after we did the label, we let 10 people to independently vote for the results. And as such that we can also tell how confident are our labeling process because this is decisive about the quality what you get as a classification map. This is the confusion metrics of the labeling. And these are the areas where we decide to choose for labeling. And this is the first global urban local climate zones map we achieved. And uh, what you see is not a, a, a background image. It's already the classification results. Although the most interesting part is the urban, you cannot see much detail of it. I can, of course, show you a lot of this kind of LCZ maps. Instead, I decided to show one, which is Munich, because everybody is familiar with. So basically, you can very nicely see where you have the compact areas. It's more the city center areas. And this uh, orange area is uh, sparse built. This is more rich areas. And you can also see these uh, industry areas and also uh, uh, dense trees, scatter trees, and so on. So this is uh, already available for Africa. And the last um, is uh, how could we tweet for social good? So uh, we are using tweets to get the uh, building functions. This is actually also part of the Munich Aerospace Research Group. and. Uh, um, as I said, people tend to uh, tweet different things at different places, also at different times. So if you look at the residential, non-residential mixed use, only look at the 724 time distribution, you already see totally different patterns. 
And on the lower one, this is a mixed use area, more the shops and so on. You see the typical uh, Munich behavior, shop starts from seven and the close already at eight. So these kind of things you can get from the tweets. And if we also do the topical modeling, uh, we can get a very nice uh, results to distinguish residential commercial. This is the ground truth, and this is what we get from tweets alone. So you can see, because not everybody tweets, you cannot get so dense information as the ground truth, but actually the patterns matches so well, I think it's a, a very good, uh, um, uh, um, let's say, a first result. And currently we are streaming uh, tweets uh, for the whole planet, <laughs> And uh, we have now about uh, 300 million tweets with geolocation. And uh, how could we turn this kind of, uh, um, uh, let's say, social media data to geo information? It's still a long way to go, but I think uh, we are on the right track. You can ask me the privacy problem later, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and our vision is that uh, in uh, 2022, we want to deliver the first and the unique global consistent 3D, 4D spatial data sets on urban morphology. At, the, at that time, if you go to any city, including the Mumbai example I showed you before, then we will be able to go far beyond what we have today, built and non-built. We will know where are the slums. And if you want to plan for a specific slum, you will be able to also get the 3D information and also the population density. And uh, more importantly, um, the data in this ERC project will be free, open and free to, to uh, uh, the public, um, because our ultimate goal is to lead to a better understanding and boost research on global globalization process. And also we want to provide this data to stakeholders like IPCC report. I think this kind of information can be very important. And uh, we actually, uh, things for global urban mapping, we don't need more information for Europe, for the US. We are more aiming at the developing areas. We are hoping through this way, this is how we're contributing to solve the poverty problem. And this is the team works on this project and we get a lot of support from our set regarding the computing resource and also the storage and etc. Well, this is the second story I want to tell. And I hope I still have five minutes time because I want to also introduce you what we have in mind for the future. Um, I start with this picture. This is actually, uh, I put all these elements together this morning. This is for me stands for AI for EO where you see the Earth, which is digitalized, and you see all these satellites, which is actually our important missions flying around. And uh, I want to pinpoint Munich. You know why? Because Munich is now becoming a gravity center of AI for you all. And here I show you a landscape, all the initiatives and the collaborations about AI for you all. Uh, one thing is the Hamholtz uh, AI, and the other thing is the Munich uh, uh, School for Data Science. For these two, I have one slide. I will talk about this later. And we are also very tightly uh, uh, um, in relation with the uh, two new data science institutes where Earth observation is a very important domain. And uh, we are supposed to get a very close uh, collaboration with math and the informatic uh, colleagues. And uh, we are also involved in the German Data Science Society as a representative for Earth observation, and of course the Field Lab uh, at ESA. And the uh, main thing I want to show in the end is the BMBF International AI Lab, which is in planning. And uh, let me start with the Hamholtz, uh, oh, the Munich um, Data Science Research School. This is something we started uh, from last year. Uh, actually, how, how, how come that we want to do this? It's actually deadly simple. We want more data scientists uh, who are uh, more into EO, but we are directly competing with internet giants, Google and, and, and so on. This doesn't work. What we really need as a solution is we need to train our Earth observation data scientists. So this was our motivation to contribute to the Munich Data Science Research School uh, the idea is that we collaborate very closely with the TUM, uh, two computer science department at uh, TUM and LMU, 
And uh, uh, Earth observation is one of the domains which is involved. The other domains are biomedicine, plasma physics, and robotics. And what we want to do is to try and PhD these students with so-called Y model. This means one computer science professor, one earth observation professor train one PhD student, or H model. So we both professors train two PhD students. And actually, we already had a sex successful round last year. And for this year, we are still opening for application. And the deadline is next uh, week. And still quite some days to go for the young people here. And the second thing is the Hamholtz AI. So this is an idea from the Hamholtz uh, uh, Association. It's more for the data science and the information initiative. And uh, this is a German-wide AI research platform with funding more than 40 million euro. And the idea is to uh, get gathering all the AI expertise in Hamholtz to further support the six domains of uh, research areas of uh, uh, Hamholtz. So now uh, we, uh, it's organized by one central unit and five local units. The central unit is now with the house. And uh, we, uh, in Oberfavonhofen, we win the local unit for the aeronautics space and the transport. So we are basically responsible for the AI research, uh, which is uh, applied to this domain. And this actually started from this year. And the last one is um, the most important one I want to mention. This is uh, what is planning, but I think uh, we can happily share with uh, this uh, group. And we have a, a proposal schizo summit to the BMBF, International Future Labs of Artificial Intelligence, which is approved. The whole lab is about three main topics, reasoning, uncertainties, ethics, and beyond. And this is a collaboration between our new faculty, represented by me as the PI, with the TUM Data Science Institute, represented by Professor Massimo Falancia, who is uh, one of the future directors. And then the very new TUM as, uh, Institute for Ethics in AI. This is launched actually last month. And also a German Aerospace Center, uh, Earth Observation Center, which is represented by my colleague, uh, Professor Richard Bamner. So what is this about? This is our mission. And most importantly here, this picture. So the, the whole lab will be in our Ludwig uh, Birkhoff campus, maybe not in this building, <laughs> some other buildings we are still uh, looking for. And the whole mission is that we want to bring 20 uh, renowned uh, international organizations across nine countries and all together 20 highly ranked scientists plus actually 100 beyond fellows, I will talk about this later, to here and work on three main topics, reasoning, uncertainty, and ethics. And the impact of this lab is supposed to not only advance as a persuasion science, but also actually make key contribution to interpretability and ethic implications of AI. And also we want to support AI for your technology transfer. And with this effort, we actually want to uh, consolidate the pole position of Germany in AI for EO. And here is showing how this lab is linked to these 20 different organizations. You can see Plan Labs is on board, Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, and the guards and the um, NUST from Pakistan, Wuhan University, Nanjing University from, from China. And this is basically uh, the link so see here, this is basically where people are coming from. And here is the concept. I know there is an online stream, therefore I removed the names because it's still in planning. But you can see we focus on the reasoning topic to say a few words about it. Now in EO, it's very easy to do the recognition. Where is the buildings, where is the roads, and where are the green space? But still to derive knowledge from this type of information is still missing. So how could you, for instance, relate it to psychoeconomic values if you see a combination of buildings, streets, and green areas? So this is the things we want to look at with the reasoning part. And the second part is uncertainty. So we now, being able to show so many fancy results to you with deep learning and other AI techniques, why the stakeholders, politicians, and the citizens they are not yet rely on our results. 
because deep learning, all these kind of algorithms, is still like a black box. What you get as a result, you cannot give the uncertainty in your results. This is really a killing factor, uh, going from the lab results to the real reality, real use. So this is another thing we want to focus on. How could we quantify the uncertainties in the results produced by AI? And the last thing is uh, ethics. So this is not yet mentioned in the Earth observation um, community, but it's important. Because if you do, for instance, you do slum mapping by uh, generating some training data set, uh, sets by yourself, have you considered different social groups, how they are distributed? Are there any data bars in your data? And also, if you have an AI uh, model uh, works for you, ha have you considered all the ethics in these AI algorithms? I think this is a very important key aspect we also need to consider if we really want to uh, use it as a powerful way to deliver information for grand so societal challenges. So these are the three topics. I didn't put the name, but you see already where these people are from. And I also have planned a Beyond the Fellow program. This is supposed for a rich number of talented young scientists at the doctor or the postdoctor level. They should just come to us with uh, 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 attractive AI for your topic, and they can stay with lab, collaborate with the scientists there with the time period they named. So this is basically the idea. It's a very open and free uh, things, and we want to do cutting edge research. And uh, this is the, well, it will be at the um, um, Ludwig uh, Birkhoff campus of Tum. <laughs> this is a perspective picture. The reality is uh, this is the things we're currently looking for. We want to have a Google style of lab. We should have a big open space with a lot of office space. And we are also quite under time pressure because uh, if everything works well, it should already start from April. So this is our mission. And basically, this brings me to the end of my talk. I'll come back to this picture. So in the beginning, I used it as, uh, as, uh, because it shows the home common perspective as, uh, with Earth observation. And uh, Mr. Kliminka mentioned uh, uh, our mission is the Earth. When this was announced in Ju July the 1st, I was wondering, what does this mean to our Earth observation scientists? So I start to wonder. I mean, what could be more meaningful if we can promise a health planet for our grand, grand, grand children, right? So there are climate change, urbanization, all of the issues there. I mean, the least thing what we could do uh, as Earth observation scientists is to take the great advantage of advances in sensors and also technology like AI, we can try to deliver key information to support uh, different intervention process or whatever. So that's all for my talk, and uh, thank you very much.